Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to IAG Trade Talk. We've got a very special presentation for you here today. We are going to be talking about the uh, proposed revisions to the Macau Gaming Law. First time this has uh, happened for 20 years, so it's a big thing in Asian gaming and uh, particularly in Macau, of course. And we have an esteemed panel to join us to talk about uh, these matters. But before I introduce our panel, I'm just going to run through a little bit of background, uh, which many of you will already know, but uh, some of you may not, about the history behind the Macau gaming law. So Macau, as I think everybody knows, was handed over from Portugal to China on the 20th of December 1999 and became the Macau SAR. The then chief executive, Edmund Ho, announced in November 2000 that there would be a liberalisation to the gaming industry. It wouldn't be a monopoly anymore. And uh, then Law 16 uh, of 2001, commonly known as the Macau Gaming Law, was passed in August uh, of 2001. There was a tender process in November of 2001, which saw three winners announced on the 8th of February 2002. And I think we all know those winners were SJM, Win, and Galaxy. And we were off to the races with three concessionaires. Uh, but then not very long after that, I think it was about six months or so, uh, Galaxy uh, and then Venetian, now Sands, parted ways and we had the sub-concessionaires come along with SJM then uh, it, uh, giving MGM their sub-concessionaire and uh, win uh, selling their sub-concessionaire to Melco for 900 million US dollars. All those concessions uh, then were aligned to end on the 26th of June, 2002. So we're now uh, well under one year to go to that day, uh, to the end of the 20 years. And uh, in that period of time, in that 20 years, we have seen an enormous amount of growth in Macau Gaming, of course, from 2002 right through to 2015. Uh, a few hiccups from 2015 to today, but uh, Macau, uh, unbalanced to all back in 2002, established itself as the uh, by far largest casino gaming jurisdiction in the world. So the stakes are enormous. Um, we had a midterm review in 2016 by the University of Macau's um, Institute for the Study of Commercial Gaming, which largely gave a tick of approval to all six concessionaires, and we'll call them concessionaires rather than concessionaires and sub-concessionaires just for brevity. And then it was announced that in the second half of this year, there would be a public consultation process to uh, look at the a revision of the Macau Gaming Law, given that 20 years had passed, and after the Legislative Assembly elections on the 12th of September, we were all taken a little bit by surprise by less than 48 hours later, a press conference was announced and the uh, Secretary for Economy and Finance uh, announced that there would be a public consultation process beginning the very next day for 45 days through to the 29th of October. And at the press conference, he uh, presented uh, a consultation document. And to speak with us now on the uh, extent of the consultation document, we've got um, a three uh, great panellists. I'd like to introduce them one by one. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, David Green. David is chairman of New Page Consulting. And if I was to read his entire bio, that would be, hour and that would be an hour gone. So I'll just give you a quick summary um, of it. He was formerly chairman of the Independent Gambling Authority of South Australia, so the South Australian regulator. Also uh, a former commissioner for Com consumer affairs in South Australia, chairman of Silver Her Heritage, which operates casino in Nepal, uh, and formerly a director of uh, uh, Donaco or Donaco, if you prefer, which operates uh, casinos in Cambodia and Vietnam. But more importantly than all of those, probably is the fact that he advised the Macau government on the liberalisation of the gaming industry 20 years ago and the general regulation of the gaming industry. David lived in Macau for more than 14 years. And as I say, there he has many other uh, qualifications, but that's that's enough for now. Uh, David Green, uh, welcome. 
Yes, thanks, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's great to have you here, and I'm sure you'll have a, a lot uh, to add. Our second panellist is uh, Ryan Ho. Ryan is a lecturer at the Centre uh, for Gaming and Tourism Studies at the Macau Polytechnic Institute. Uh, he's got numerous uh, qualifications, including three degrees, one of which is uh, a Master of International Business Law from the University of Macau. He's also studied in Taiwan. And his work at the Centre for uh, Gaming and Tourism Studies includes research uh, with uh, a number of academic papers he's published, uh, particularly on uh, his re special research interests of gaming law and junkets. Uh, he teaches uh, undergraduate and graduate students um, at the Macau Polytechnic Institute. So uh, welcome to the panel, Ryan. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here and meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. And our uh, third panellist is uh, Rui Prenza. He is managing partner of MDME, uh, a leading law firm in Macau uh, with offices in Hong Kong and Portugal. Uh, Rui's been in Macau since 2008. He specialises in M&A transactions, but particularly focuses on Macau's gaming sector. So he, he has clients who are operators, uh, investors, uh, gaming technology companies, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, he's authored several publications on gaming, speaks regularly at gaming conferences, and is a regular con contributor to IAG. So, uh, Rui, welcome uh, to our panel. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So I'm sure you'll all agree we've got a, a very esteemed panel here. I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say on, on, on the items in the consultation paper. Just before we get into the first item, just a brief uh, a brief description of the consultation paper. So it was issued in traditional Chinese and Portuguese, the official languages of Macau, no English version, of course. Uh, it was 59 pages long and it was broken up into nine numbered headings. And in fact, we're going to use those nine numbered headings to, to structure um, our panel discussion today. Um, item number three was actually broken up into 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3. And item number nine was broken up into 9.1 and 9.2. So we've actually got 12 things to cover with uh, some of the subheadings. And I think those items range from the relatively inconsequential right up to the potentially industry changing or industry defining, depending uh, on how those items are interpreted. There was also five public consultation sessions announced by the DICJ, Macau's Gaming Regulator, the first one was held on September 20, and it was limited to uh, concessionaires, junkets, uh, junket agents, and the media. Um, IAG attended that, and it was attended by many big names in the industry. Uh, the subsequent four have been affected by uh, COVID, and just uh, yesterday has been announced by the DICJ that they will occur on October 22, 23, 24, and 25 with a morning and afternoon session. So for that four days, uh, the public of Macau is going to have an opportunity to, to speak at length uh, about the uh, industry and the revisions to the gaming law. So having given you that long introduction, now let's move into the consultation paper itself. <laughs> and the first item listed on the consultation paper is the number of concessionaires. Obviously, we have six at the moment, three plus three. Um, David Green, how many concessionaires should Macau have? Well, that's a good question, Andrew. Um, I think the answer from my perspective is uh, six. Uh, there is no strong case, I believe, to remove any of the existing operators, whether they're called concessionaires or sub-concessionaires, from the marketplace. There are several reasons for that. Firstly, uh, they've all shown a commitment to Macau by investing very substantial amounts, certainly well in excess of their initial contracted investment requirements, which uh, averaged around a billion US dollars per concession. Uh, secondly, it encouraged competition at a level which I think is healthy uh, we've certainly seen a proliferation of gaming equipment as a result, but that has been attenuated somewhat by the government moving to cap table numbers in 2012. 
Um, gaming machines, of course, have grown uh, certainly far quicker, uh, in part because of that limitation. But uh, again, it's not really a market that uh, favours machine gaming, certainly not at this stage of its evolution. It's still very much a table market. Uh, and I guess the, uh, the third reason for staying with SIX is simply to provide a diversified revenue stream for the government itself, not only from special gaming tax, which uh, has been a constant, but also uh, through corporations tax uh, and through the spread of activities that these concessionaires have been able to pursue. Um, the concessionaires at Retender will be looking at a number of things which will uh, either secure their interest or not, as the case may be. One of those is the number of concessions that will actually be available. Um, concessionaires will pay for limited exclusivity in the market. What they won't pay for is a market that is opened to uh, any number of new participants because that will impact their market share and their capacity to drive returns on future investment. We don't have any disqualifying instances that I know of that impact any of the existing concession holders. Uh, there have been no events that have come to light that would suggest that anyone is unsuitable or indeed not financially capable of supporting ongoing operations. Uh, I should add here, though, a cautionary note, and that is that under the current circumstances in which the, the concessionaires are operating, uh, there is a finite lifetime to how long they can maintain their current operations, uh, given the restricted demand and consumption of gaming product in Macau. As we know, that's due to extraneous circumstances and uh, there's not a lot that can be done about that, certainly while the government continues to pursue a zero COVID policy. But in summary, I think uh, it would be an unfortunate development to see any of the six operators lose their uh, license or their concession to operate in Macau. And uh, indeed, the government has conceded that there are six operators, uh, concessionaires, who uh, presently operate under that privilege. So notwithstanding the uh, uh, description of three of them as sub-concessionaires, in substance, they do have their own operating rights. Ryan and Rui, you've been very uh, patient there. Uh, let me throw a couple of questions to you. In in the uh, consultation document, there was a mention of quality versus quantity, and there was even a line, that, and I quote, it said, too many concessionaires might lead to intense competition and difficult supervision. Do you think this might be interpreted that they want to reduce the number of concessionaires from six? I, I will go. Yes, please. please. Go ahead. I agree with uh, David. There will be a limited number of customer gaming concessions, that's for sure. Um, I also believe that the number of customer establishment will be controlled to, you know, it will take all efforts to get approval for a new customer development project. Um, as you can see, having a few world class resort matter more than just establish many small casino property in this city, right? So um, a new casino project must offer a rich combination of leisure and business options, including iconic architecture, tourist attractions, family friendly and business related amenity and so on. So I think this is uh, the focus of uh, uh, what we've been talking about, the quality over quantity, right? Rui, do you have any comments on that? 
No, I, I, I agree. I think I think Ryan's point is, is a very good point. It's it's hard to disagree with the principle of, of quality over quantity in, in any circumstances, and particularly at, at the stage of market maturity where we are. Um, but I, I do believe, as, as David was saying, that 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 balance and, and the quality that the operators brought to the market is evident. Um, and, and I think, obviously, if you look at the uh, the policy drivers of, of the first original law, they I think they they were fulfilled beyond expectation, particularly on the tax revenue on on the employment side. Uh, naturally, now we'll we'll have different policy objectives to add to those ones, uh, but but I don't believe that uh, any of the existing concessionaires wouldn't be uh, perfectly fit to to deliver that. I think, as Brian was saying, um, this could be, and I read it more in that way. Uh, the uh, quality over quantity in the number of casino properties that that we have, rather than the number of, of concessionaire operators. And and I think if there are there are going to be more casino properties, uh, there will be much more stringent criteria on how those properties will will look like and what they have to deliver. Um, if we're going to have them at all. Uh, so I, I would read that principle. And when we say, I think there was a lot of speculation when the document came out that limit the number of concessions mean, meant to restrict or, or dimin diminish the, the number of existing concessions. I, I don't read it like that. The limit is, exists in the in, in the current law uh, and it will obviously exist in, in, uh, in an amendment to this law. Uh, it doesn't mean that there will be less than six. I think we, we, we've pretty much done number one, but uh, on, on the number of concessions, it seems we're, we're, we're all in agreement, six. But I just wanted to ask one question. Um, there's, there's no consideration in that document to talking about individually licensing casinos rather than concessions. In uh, David, my understanding in Las Vegas, the casinos are individually licensed rather than concessions, but there seems to be no mention of going in that direction uh, I think that's right, uh, Andrew. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the system actually allows for that sort of control. Uh, what the government, I think, could do, uh, as they did with the table game cap, is simply uh, announce um, that there will also be a cap on the number of casinos. Now, whether that's a blanket cap or a cap that's capable of escalation over time, uh, like the table cap, uh, remains to be seen. But I don't really see any reason for the government to suddenly decide to start licensing casino premises. They're approved, obviously, by the regulator, DICJ, before they're able to begin operation. Um, but having uh, a further overlaid regulatory process on that, I think, is probably unnecessary. And I guess a, a final point on that, which I might make myself and not throw to you guys, is if there were to be another operator come in, who? I mean, it's quite hard to look around the world and see, find companies that would be capable of the kind of financial investment and, and operating uh, uh, operating ability, with the possible exception, I guess, of Genting. It's very hard to find uh, other companies that can operate on the kind of scale we have in Macau. But let's let's move on from that. Looks like we're agreed on six. <coughs> Excuse me. Um the number, so on to number two, the length of the concession. So uh, Law 16, 2001, the gaming law established 20 years with a possible except, uh, extension up to five years. Seems to be language in the document that implies that they might want to reduce the length of the um, concession. Um, Ryan, do you have a, a view uh, on that? Oh, I think it makes sense to review the ground period. 20 years is definitely a long time, right? Uh, Macau was once the only major casino gaming provider in Asia. And now we've got lots of competition in the region. Uh, I reckon about 10 years might be a reasonable period of time for the government to adjust and respond to any industry changes. And also very important for operator committing to invest and develop their casino project here with a long-term focus. So we've heard SJM actually come out and mention 10 years, but there's been a bit of pushback on, on, on that number given the relatively low returns or very low returns right now in the COVID environment um, we've got at the moment. Um, any alternative views on a, a, length, of, a length of concession? Uh, well, I certainly have an alternative view. I think um, the concessions really should 
run for as long as possible. And uh, if it was possible to extend them out to 2049, uh, I would uh, certainly counsel the government that that was a good idea rather than a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, again, for several reasons. One is that <clears throat> it obviously allows a longer period of time for what will inevitably be a slower payback uh, on these new investments. Um, secondly, the operators are the people best placed to respond to competitive pressure, not the government. The government doesn't operate the casinos. Uh, the, they're operated, obviously, by the concessionaires who are intensely aware of where that competitive pressure is coming from and the sort of responses that they need to adopt to ensure that they can meet and hopefully overwhelm those challenges. Um, I think also it brings certainty to the market, uh, particularly the people of Macau who are strongly reliant on the industry for employment and future opportunities and for tourism operators who look to the gaming industry, I think, to be a leader rather than a follower in developing new offerings for that tourist market. Um, and the final point to make, uh, which I'll do briefly, is if you only extend for a short period, uh, you end up slicing and dicing what remains to the point where there is no return to government. Mm. What is very clear is that operators will pay a premium for a longer term. Uh, but since the shorter term intensifies their risk, uh, I don't see them paying a, a huge premium for that opportunity. And, and of course, for anybody who, who might not have picked up on the significance of 2049, it is the end of the SAR arrangements, the 50 years of one country, two system from 1999 to 2049. So um, perhaps Rui, as the, as the resident lawyer here, you could talk a little bit about 20, 2049 and speculate on on that. I guess sovereign risk, uh, you know, investors are going to be reluctant to invest in the 2030s, in the late 2030s, knowing that they don't really have any idea what happens in 2049. Well, thank you. thank you. Thank you for the confidence, but I think it's beyond my capabilities to uh, uh, to foresee what's going to happen after uh, 2049. Um, what I do believe it's it's there's obviously a, it's a significant milestone, and I, I do not think whatever happens uh, can go beyond beyond that period. Um, I tend to agree with with David in, in a longer concession period. I think it was created somehow the perception in Macau that if you um, if if the term of the concession the concessions is looming, that somehow the government can keep the concessionaires in a tight leash and make them contribute, uh, you know, more effectively towards what the government believes is the the, the policy goals it wants to achieve and so on. I think um, uh, from what I've been seeing, the concessionaires and I within Kukarali we have been have been great corporate citizens uh, at many levels, uh, particularly during this, this these very tough times. Um, and uh, and I, I'm not sure if that's because they're on a tight leash or not, but what, you, what I do see is that a, a, a very short concession uh, term would impair their ability to invest and their willingness to invest. And I think it, it somehow, it, it's also created the perception that because most of the, the, the code tie or most of the developments are already uh, you know, up, up and running, that there won't be significant investment needs that would warrant a longer concession period. I don't think that's right. I think for many reasons uh, that uh, a significant amount of investment will still be required. Um, it will be required to, to invest in, in non-gaming amenities to finally transform the product uh, in a more, more family-oriented product. I think if we, as the document uh, points towards, uh, want to tap into other markets, markets other than mainland China, there's investment to be done there. Uh, to be able to attract those uh, those those travelers, and and there's significant investments to be made also on the refurbishment of, of the properties. I think you know if you look at Venetian, I think it was built around in 2008. It, it's probably uh, overdue for a refurbishment. That's going to be a massive investment, um, and and you see the, the very successful case of the Lendener now, where where it was not only refurbished but but transformed. 
uh, into something much better. So you want to incentivize the operators to do that. You need to, to allow them for longer periods of, of return and stability. Now, I think to, to Ryan's point, uh, it, it is necessary to, to make sure that the, the obligations in the contract are being fulfilled, that the government expects flexibility to, to adapt as we go. Um, but I think we can we can have contractual mechanisms that, that could address that and periodical reviews uh, to make sure that the operators are, are going in the right direction. Well, I guess periodical reviews are, uh, are not unheard of. We see them in uh, Singapore. We see them in Victoria and Australia. They're planned for Japan. I mean, on your point about refurbishment, I, I, I was recently speaking to a, a, a C-level executive uh, leader of one of the concessionaires who, of course, shall remain nameless, and I and I postulated that perhaps thirty or forty billion would be invested in the next decade or two, just merely in refurbishment and uh, phase twos and phase threes, subsequent phases. And he just laughed at me and said, "Easily," he said, "That's already on the books." So you know, I think we've we've invested about fifty billion so far, or perhaps even a little more um, in in the the industry. We could be looking at investing that much yet again on the next cycle. So there needs to be that 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 return on investment. Um, let, look, let's move on to number three in the uh, consultation document, which is about supervision. And in fact, there are three parts to this, all of which have been the matter of quite a bit of discussion uh, and, and discourse. Uh, one about the capitalization of, of, of concessionaires, one about uh, local ownership and one about dividends. So we'll take them one at a time. Let's start with the capitalization of concessionaires. There's a requirement for concessionaires to have a minimum capital of 200 million uh, Macau Patakas, which is about 25 million US dollars. Um, might have sounded like a big number 20 years ago. Doesn't sound like a big number today. Um, perhaps, uh, Rui, you could have a bit of a, a talk about uh, uh, that. What do you think, from a legal point of view, um, can be said about that, that issue? Well, I think the the the, the capital uh, or, or the share capital that, um, that that that's been established, as you mentioned, I think it was a figure that that makes sense uh, twenty years ago, and and to, to the extent that the, the share capital and and on top of that the, the non distributable reserves that are mandatory serve as as retention thresholds uh, to ensure that the company permanently retains a, a certain uh, level of net assets. Uh, I think the reality has proven that that figure is outdated. Uh, and so I don't see it as particularly concerning that uh, it is revised. I think it should be revised. Uh, obviously, I, I, I couldn't put a figure to it, but uh, and, and it depends obviously on what, what the limit or at the, the minimum threshold is going to be. But uh, I, I, I think this is a measure that, that makes sense. I think in fixed assets alone, the concessionaires uh, you know, if, if, uh, are way uh, above this uh, the minimum thresholds, and so I don't think it's 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 a big issue. Yes, I mean it hasn't been brought up very much, so let's move on from that. And, uh, unless they want to increase that to some enormous uh, number, I don't think it's going to be a great concern to anybody. Um, but the sec this next one has been a matter of a lot of discussion, which is the so-called executive director, who's currently required to hold ten percent of the uh, uh, capital of a concessionaire. Um, Ryan, I might go to you on this one. Um, although it is 10%, the question remains, is it 10% of the economic uh, interest? Is it 10% of the voting rights? What kind of 10% is it? I do note that um, Dr. Rui Cunha stood up in the September 20, uh, on behalf of SJM, on the September 20 uh, event at the DICJ and asked for clarity on exactly what sort of person would have to hold that? And there was a direct answer given to him, which was any Macau resident. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on this 10% and how it, you know, what number it might go to and exactly how it would be implemented? Well, this is a very tough question. You know, uh, the government is proposing to increase Macau permanent residence capital share in the gaming company as uh, proposed in the consultation paper, right? In a sense, we will have a local resident with enough capital or voting share to offer a local perspective. And this particular person can also influence the business decision in the boardroom. So uh, 
we may have a say in the gaming company in a, in a way. So that's uh, my first thought about uh, having this uh, amendment. But I'm uh, I'm not. Sh- uh, we don't have enough detail to assess uh, the percentages. So uh, whether they have any final say or whether they have any any particular economic value uh, for a particular company. Yes. You you just mentioned there talking about an individual. I mean, do you think it would have to be an individual, or do you think it could be multiple individuals who are Macau residents adding up to whatever that magic number might happen to be? According to existing gaming law, this is only uh, one managing director, right? I do think it may continue this uh, tradition. It would be easier to to sort of uh, as a uh, liaison person or counterpoint the government, right? Okay, and um, any other thoughts on on that from the rest of the panel? Uh, I, look, I'd offer this observation that originally the executive director was not only to hold equity but also to be delegated certain management functions. Um, and of course, you can't delegate management functions to a collective of people and hope to have organised response. Um, so I think I agree with Ryan. It's likely to remain as an individual. I think the concern might be, however, apart from the fact that if there is an acquisition required, there are very few people that could fund it in Macau. Yes. Um, but you know the, the other the other issue about this is that uh, we have to be conscious of what sort of decision making or um, powers the executive director actually has. Um, all of the current concessionaires have undertaking, undertaken considerable uh, borrowing to finance their developments and entered into a number of lending covenants. Now, traditional covenants include things like change of control. And uh, if there was to be any evidence that um, the powers of the executive director would extend to events that might constitute change of control, uh, there needs to be some deep thinking put into just what that uh, arrangement looks like, because uh, otherwise you're going to be sending concessionaires off to talk to the lenders about trying to renegotiate those covenants. On to the um, dividend distribution point. This has also been uh, one of great discussion. And David, I'm going to stick with you on this one uh, to begin with. We have uh, potentially a conflict here between shareholders' rights and the government being able to control the dividend. We don't know whether that's going to be discretionary or whether that's going to be, there's no clarity on the document as to whether that's based upon certain well defined principles that a dividend will then be approved if those principles are stuck to. Um, it also raises issues, doesn't it, of, you know, the, these concessionaires are one company in a gr- larger group of companies offering non-gaming, gaming, all sorts of different things in the integrated resorts. And the financing is generally done collectively. So dividends need to stream around in amongst the group. I mean, what, what are your comments on that, David, and how that might even affect the investment community's reaction? I think the apprehension might be that the government does want to exercise close control over those dividend streams, and um, that removes a very critical component of the functioning of uh, of boards particularly, Uh, not only the boards of the concession companies themselves, but as you point out, uh, group holding companies, which uh, may hold uh, a majority interest in those concessions. And... As you know, um, all of the existing concession operators are subsidiaries of listed companies in Hong Kong. So the public already holds an interest in uh, these concessionaires, albeit indirectly, uh, through uh, their shareholdings in those Hong Kong listed entities. Um, I think the uh, announcement is so vague that it's it's quite difficult to form a view as to how this is likely to impact at the organic level of, of each concession. But I would uh, 
be certainly hesitant to think that the government's judgment on this might, in fact, uh, uh, replace the judgment of the board, the duly elected board, of uh, the companies that are making decisions to pay. Um, and uh, I think it's something that they really need to have dialogue with the existing concessionaires about before they implement any system to uh, regulate that flow. Any, any comments from the rest of the panel on this one? Yeah, Andrew, I think uh, this is uh, obviously something new. Uh, it, it, it has no parallel on, on, on our legal framework. Um, so it's important to, to, I think, go deep on this and understand what, what is trying to be achieved. And, and when I read the policy document, I, I think I can segment uh, three policy objectives that are underlying to this uh, proposal. Uh, one is to guarantee the continuous investment in, in economic development, in diversified economic development, to maximize the benefits that the, the casino industry generates to the community and to assure the solvency of, of, of the concessionaires. Now, I, I think if, if we look at each of them or all in, uh, in, in all aggregated, th these are fair, these are legitimate. But what I question is two things. One is the uh, effectiveness of the measure to actually uh, guarantee uh, that these objectives are fulfilled. And, and the other thing is, uh, it, does the uh, downsides of this measure, which for me are evident, uh, do they uh, warrant that such a, a limitation, uh, such a restriction to what is an inherent uh, basic right of a, of a shareholder uh, is justified? And, and I think it's not. I think this, uh, these objectives could be achieved uh, in different manners. Uh, if we're talking about assuring the solvency of gaming concessionaires, there's uh, an array of different measures that, that you can import from other industries, particularly bank, banking and, and insurance, prudential rules that are designed to assure precisely that, um, and that would not interfere at that level of, of, of dividend distribution. Um, there could be, again, uh, the contracts are the instruments that govern the relationship between the concessionaires and the government. So if, if there are investment obligations to be made, they can be contractualized, there can be penalties uh, if, if they're not fulfilled. Uh, and I think it's much easier, much clearer, um, and therefore certain, if you simply establish uh, in contract what are the obligations of investment of a concessionaire in the local economy. Uh, and this could be specific obligations, it could be a, a dollar figure. Uh, and from that moment on, I think the operators you know, uh, know the rules of the game and are not uh, left in limbo um, uh, in, in uh, waiting if uh, they are going to be able to distribute or not dividends to their shareholders. And as David was saying, this, this may have a, a significant impact on the way that they are currently financed, structured, uh, and if, if limits are imposed, uh, this, may, uh, this may constitute uh, an impediment for, for certain types of institutional investors to actually hold shares at the holding level. So this is very, very sensitive, could, could have uh, impacts that I think need to be very well thought. Uh, and in my view, we should find alternatives uh, to, to achieve the same goals. I might just stick with this one for a little while because this is probably arguably even the most important point in, in the consultation document. A lot of people have been talking about uh, about this. Brian, I from your view uh, too. I, I've heard, and, and anybody, please jump in. I've heard things ranging from as far as, oh, they just wanted to make sure the chip liability is covered and there were situations where certain concessionaires maybe couldn't cover their chip liability of all the chips that were out there or potentially other liabilities as well. And it's a, a solvency issue, as you just mentioned, Rui, all the way through to almost conspiracy theory type things like they don't want any money to leave uh, Macau. And, and you can read that in various different ways. You know, they don't want money to be streaming through to foreign operators, or maybe they just want to see more and more development within Macau, keep that money within Macau. I mean, Ryan, do you have a do you have a view on that, or anybody else jump in? I mean, and I've heard a few other things in between as well. Any any other thoughts on this dividend issue, since it is such a big issue that people have been talking about? Yes, I agree with you, Andrew. Good thing is it helps conserve the the capital, leaving something for a rainy day, or for future uh, sort of casino sort of development with development. Well, as as uh, as we all mentioned, this could also be bad news to investor 
and the stock market, giving companies market value will be discounted to affect such a proposed different rule. So uh, we'll see. I think it might be uh, a mechanism, a mechanism to uh, to be set up uh, as uh, David uh, just mentioned. There will be a open dialogue uh, between the government and the operator before they announce any important decision. So I think this is a way uh, to sort of uh, a collaboration between uh, the government and, and the operator in terms of uh, the distribution of profit to the shareholders. Could I just chip in with some additional remarks, uh, Andrew? Um, the lenders are the people that will know whether uh, there's any risk to either liquidity or solvency. And they'll know because they have ratios that they test periodically, which go to establishing that there is ongoing viability. The second point to make is that under the existing Law 16, both the external auditors and the finance department have got the capacity and indeed the duty in the case of the external auditors to advise the government if they become aware of any circumstance which may be a cause for concern. Yes. I raise the finance department because they, with DICJ, have the power to order special investigations and audits. So it's not as though there's an absence of power to either monitor or investigate concerns in this regard. Well, it's an interesting point you raise. So it perhaps gives weight to the argument that there's there's other uh, other things behind it. Well, we've given that a, a good go over. Let's move on to the next um, point is um, employee protection is number four raised in the consultation document. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that over the last 20 years, the, the status of, of employees uh, local Macau employees within the concessionaires. Um, uh, anybody like to have a go in, uh, at that one, talking about employee protect, protection and how employees are treated by the concessionaires in Macau? Well, I, I'd just start by noting, I don't think it's a Law 16 issue. Um, law 16 is, is the gaming law. Uh, the only reference it really makes to employees is uh, occasionally to key employees, which is an undefined term and uh, currently um, open to interpretation as to what that means. If it's to remain in the law, then there needs to be some clarity about not only who key employees are, but what obligations might be imposed on them. Um, and, of course, the executive director is a, uh, a person and potentially an employee director. But uh, to me, uh, the issue of um, employment, the protection of uh, uh, jobs, uh, the reservation of exclusivity for dealing positions to Macau residents are really matters somewhat outside the scope of the law. Ryan, perhaps I'll go to you on this one as somebody born and bred in Macau. I mean, it's often raised about employees. It seems, as David says, it's perhaps not something for a gaming law. Maybe they just wanted to make the point about it. I mean, how do you feel about this item being in the consultation document, your reaction to that? Well, as a local uh, born and bred here in Macau, I'm happy with this positive action, of course. Uh, there must be some matrix to measure the uh, the upward mobility or any other professional training to promote the local's career development. Still, still, we must ensure Macau remains a welcoming environment for international gaming talent. Local and foreign talent will definitely determine the future of Macau as a major gaming and hospital of uh, leisure and hospitality hub. That's uh, that's uh, the issue that I want to raise, that instead of uh, not just uh, protecting the local, we need to embrace uh, the global uh, workforce culture. And, and forgive, me, forgive me for going slightly off topic here, off the gaming law for a second, because this has been a, a red hot issue for many, many years. Ryan, just to talk to you a little bit more about how you balance those things, because obviously when the industry was liberalised, 
a lot of talent came from outside of Macau to help Macau to develop a world-class, uh, highly competitive industry. Now, that's happened. In fact, now Macau is telling the rest of the world how to do things. Uh, but uh, then there's the issue, you know, then people who are from overseas sometimes think, well, maybe too many people are being sent back now. Of course, it's a very uh, noble and correct goal that people who are based here in Macau, live in Macau, Macau locals, um, upskill themselves and increase their talent, and that's desirable. But what do you think about this issue of, of balance? Some people think maybe it's gone a little bit too far. Some There's even been in the past, for example, Francis Lloyd from Galaxy has said, perhaps we should consider 5% of the dealers coming from mainland China or something like that to so that there's more Mandarin speaking, you know, dealers, that sort of thing. I mean, do you have any comments on that that kind of issue, which is an ongoing issue here in Macau? Well, in my opinion, um, gaming and, and the whole hospitality industry is, is actually a people-first business. So uh, we need to have people to interact with our client, patrons and, and customers. So, so I think it's uh, not to not just focusing on the local uh, talent, we must uh, sort of uh, open our horizon and try to uh, accept uh, different types of uh, work culture and even the trend. Nowadays, people uh, move around. There are a lot of tourists, and uh, not only from Asia, but uh, from other parts of the world. So we may need uh, a number of uh, talent from different continents to work together so that we can contribute ourselves uh, and. And as the government uh, always uh, pro uh, proposed that we, we need to build as a well center for, for leisure and, and stuff like that, right? You raise a good point there. I mean, often we get stuck in the mindset of all the customers are from mainland China. And in fact, th this document makes it clear that the Macau government is looking for us to diversify our customer base and have customers from different places in the world. Uh, so that's um, a point very well made. Um, Let's move on to number five now on the list, which was about junket supervision. And again, Ryan, I'm going to go to you a little bit here because this is your area of expertise, uh, junket, that you've written quite some interesting papers on that. Um, there's talk there about key position suitability. There's mentions about uh, Regulation 6 of 2002, which is currently being reviewed, I understand. And there's also even talk about um, concessionaire liability for junket actions um, and you know, questions about how far that extends, that sort of thing. But what are your thoughts on junkets generally and how the gaming law revision might, might encompass what we've learned about the VIP industry over the last 20 years? Well, I think for this junket issue, it seems to be a foregone conclusion, right? So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have to acknowledge that uh, the junket has contributed a lot over the past uh, 20 years to the development and the overall uh, gaming uh, revenues. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, however, the VIP junket system has been associated with some undesirable business practices, as we heard of. So, uh, it is essential that uh, the government uh, impose a tougher regulatory framework for gaming promoters, as well as a myriad of collaborators, those associates. I suggest that um, junkets of different sizes be regulated at levels proportional to their business uh, scale, size, uh, let's say, uh, warrant value, uh, capital structure, uh, the number of table control, the number of VIP rooms in operation and, 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 and things like that. So I um, hopefully, I think with this sort of multi-faceted safeguard, safeguard uh, we can lead to a highly regulated junket operation and foster the long-term development of the gaming as well as the VIP gaming industry here in Macau. And construction there, in a, in a way, must act as a de facto frontline supervisor to their gaming promoters. So um, they technically administer the VIP gaming operation and rooms needs with the government. And I guess in future, gaming promoters and their associates can only play the role of, let's say, service provider at casino instead of 
uh, what uh, acting as a heavy weight uh, in the sector. That's my two cents. So you're saying that, that they, they should look to change their role to service provider rather than somebody who's participating in the revenue share of gaming itself. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Because look at uh, Vegas, look at Singapore. They are sort of like an agent, uh, independent agent or the IMA, right? The international market agent. They work for the casino and they, they try to bring some premium uh, client to casino and provide all the su uh, supporting services instead of uh, sort of in Macau, they all pray at VIP rooms. So that's, uh, they got a much bigger power than, than those party in, in Singapore and, and, and Vegas. Can, David? Sorry, can I just perhaps add a note there? I, I think the traditional fun function of the junkets has been intermediation of risk because they've extended credit rather than had the casinos extend credit. The Nevada model um, and indeed Singapore both rely on the casinos extending the credit. So the agent is only their agent for the purpose of uh, authorising a player to access a marker from the mm -hmm. casino. Now, um, unfortunately, we're still in an environment where gaming debts are unenforceable in mainland China. And I think appointing uh, the existing junkets as agents of the casino and having the casinos extend credit uh, would largely be unworkable because they just cannot bring an action to enforce. Uh, so they would either have to not extend credit uh, or credit would have to be extended unlawfully. Uh, or the alternative is they extend credit with a very limited cap on it. Um, so I think that's, that's an issue. One other remark I'd make is that under the existing arrangements for junkets, uh, Regulation 6, the junket operators themselves can only, uh, where their corporations, have shareholders who are natural persons. The problem this is causing is that there's a disconnect between the junket operators and their financing because the financing is largely now dependent upon listed corporates in Hong Kong for the larger junkets, which have some rather opaque arrangements with the junket operators themselves in regard to how they finance and move funds around. And indeed, I think this has been one of the factors which has caused junkets to want to take deposits directly rather than arrange financing through their listed affiliates in Hong Kong. So one thing I think the government could look at is perhaps eliminating that restriction uh, on corporations holding shares in uh, licensed junket operators in Macau. And Andrew, if, if, if I may, uh, I think it's, it's hard to disagree that, uh, that a higher level of scrutiny and, and, and regulation of junket operations is unwelcome. Uh, and and as, as Ryan said, to extend that to the myriad of collaborators and agents and sub-agents would, would be beneficial. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, this, this should have been done a long time ago. Uh, and, and if the regulation and supervision uh, would have accompanied the market developments, perhaps we, we would have been able to avoid some of the behaviours, uh, you know, in those hot days of, of, of VIP that led to, 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 to uh, successful uh, uh, you know, crackdowns uh, throughout time. Uh, by mainland China. And perhaps uh, if, if we'd have done that, we'd have retained some autonomy on, on how to, to regulate uh, junkets on our own. But I think gotten to this point, uh, we uh, more than simply enhance the supervision. I think we need to try to understand what would be the role of gaming promoters at the light of the developments uh, in uh, mainland China's legal framework, uh, mainland China's policy, towards uh, uh, capital controls, towards uh, gaming in general, uh, the flow of funds abroad. Is there going to be still um, a room for junkets to operate in mainland China uh, uh, or, or with mainland China clients? And if yes, what, what is that role? 
or if perhaps the, the, the role of the junket should uh, progressively start to turn towards other markets uh, where we, they, they perhaps would not face the same restrictions uh, and, and could serve as, as a catalyst to penetrate uh, different markets. Because if that's one of the goals, I think it's uh, in, that's stated in the document, uh, to, to bring in players from, from other jurisdictions, that may be easier to do uh, at, at the VIP level than at the mass market level. Uh, and so I think this is, it's important that uh, it is defined, uh, even for the junkets uh, themselves, uh, what, what will be their role, what are the parameters which in which they can operate, not only here, but, but also in the mainland or, or in other places. Yeah, your, your point's well made about um, if we're going to penetrate other markets. I mean, typically, the further away somebody is, uh, the more money they have to bring, so the more likely they are to be a VIP player rather than a, a, a mass player. But we'll get on to junk. We'll, we'll, we'll continue the discussion about junkets when we get to uh, point number nine about deposits. But just one last um, interesting one. I was talking to a senior executive the other day, and he expressed a concern about concessionaire liability uh, in relation to junkets, uh, the document makes it very clear that uh, the relationship is between the government and the concessionaire and that the relationship uh, for junkets is between the concessionaire and the junket and the concessionaire is responsible for the actions of the junkets. And his question was, well, are we responsible for the actions of the junkets on our premises or, are we, or does that even extend to off our premises and the actions that they may take across the city, and if so, and a junket has multiple relationships with multiple concessionaires, which concessionaire is responsible? And does it even extend to other jurisdictions? For example, some junkets uh, are actually operators in other jurisdictions. I mean, it's an interesting question. I don't know if there's an, if anyone wants to have a go at an answer, but I, I like the question. Um, well, I'll have a go at an answer. Uh, Reg 6 is quite clear at the moment in saying that their responsibility is for behaviour on premise. Okay. Um, the problem, if, if you converted the junket operators to authorised agents of the casinos, they would have the implicit authority of the casino or ostensible authority to do anything. And there would ultimately be liability vesting back in the uh, concessionaires. So I'm not sure that the concessionaires would be wholly enthusiastic about that sort of arrangement. Um, I mean, what we've got currently is a two-level situation. One is the issue of a government licence, which involves a suitability requirement. However, that doesn't guarantee the suitability of the junkets for engagement by particular operators. So there is another layer, which is operator due diligence, and engagement under contract of those concession uh, of those licensees. Um, and there's a tendency to forget that there are two steps in the dance, not one. Yeah, that's you raise a very good point there. But anyway, let's let's move on. Um, number six in the consultation document is the government representative. Um, this has also been a, a matter of uh, a lot of uh, discourse. Uh, perhaps, Rui, we could go to you and you could explain uh, 1392M, which is the law that's referred to in the document about government representatives already exists in Macau for other concessions, non-gaming concessions, and I believe Macau Slot and Macau Jockey Club as well. Perhaps you could uh, tell the, the viewers about how that operates and we could then uh, get some comments from the, the rest of the panel to extrapolate how how that might operate in the gaming environment for con gaming concessionaires. Sure, uh, happy to do that, uh, Andrew. I, I understand that this has been one of the points that has caused you know, uh, more discussion, uh, but when, when you look at the concept of the government representative, it has been around for a long time. Uh, it, it's part of, uh, of the framework of the concessions. Uh, and it is, as you mentioned, uh, foreseen in, in, in uh, Decree Law 1392, um, which was issued in 1992. So it's been around for a long time. Uh, that, same, um, that same law uh, foresees the possibility of government appointing directors um, to companies in which it is a shareholder. Um, so, so there's a clear distinction between what would be a government appointed director and, and a so-called government representative or, or, or delegate. 
So in in in, in that uh, diploma, I think the uh, the, the roles of, the role of the of the representative is clear. Is the one of an observer. Uh, he may uh, and actually has a duty to attend to uh, board meetings, uh, uh, to meetings of, of the supervisory board, to shareholder meetings, and, and basically to report back to to the regulator. Um, so it, it does not, contrary to what was you know floated. Uh, when the document first came out, this representative does not have executive powers, does not have voto or, or uh, veto powers. Um, and, and so it, it, it should not be confused with, with the role of a director. Um, and as, as you well mentioned, uh, the government delegates are appointed to pretty much all concessionaires, uh, public utilities, you know, electricity, gas, uh, water and so on. Uh, it was appointed to the, the monopolist gaming operator, to STDM. Um, and it is still uh, there is still government representatives appointed to other gaming operators, as you mentioned, horse racing and sports betting, uh, lotteries as well uh, would, would be examples. So, so the exception, in fact, is the casino concessionaires uh, in a post-monopoly era. Brian or David, any comments on on this government representative uh, issue? Well, uh, more information is needed to assess the role and function of this government representative because uh, we are looking at uh, the law uh, quite some times ago, right? We don't know uh, the, the power and the, uh, the function. And so, so this delicate appointed by the government could play a very, very important role in supervising the customer operation at the board level. So uh, to avoid any conflict of interest or instead of uh, influencing the internal decision-making process, uh, it would be appropriate that these representatives don't generally, don't generally propose motion at board meeting, as uh, Louis uh, suggested. And, but they can have, I think they, they must have the power to veto any resolution which are against the public interest. So they, they can raise a uh, motion, but they somehow can veto any resolution which might not be good to the, to the public on the call. Um, I think my comment might uh, be limited at this stage just to how boards function. Um, they function effectively when confidential information can be exchanged and discussed. Mm. Concern I have with the monitor is, firstly, is that person limited to a single concession? Or can they be monitored for two or three concessions? Mm -hmm. um, secondly, under what obligation are they uh, likely to, to operate, uh, to res retain confidences? Uh, what we can't have is a situation where there are leakages of what could be highly sensitive information from one concessionaire to another. Uh, and if that was to be facilitated by a monitor or observer functioning on a, a board or even a board committee, I think that would be uh, a, a very unfortunate outcome. One executive actually said to me, um, if there were, one comment he made was, um, okay, if each of the six of us get a, a representative or a delegate, as some people are calling it, uh, the Portuguese being delegados. So uh, I think we've decided in English we're calling it representative. He said, well, what, what if we get a really tough one and what if one of the other ones gets a, an easier one? You know, how, how does the government decide who gets what? Um, so there's a point there. Rui, I think you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think in, in, uh, in both uh, scenarios, uh, one that uh, we stick to the, to the letter of the existing legislation and we're talking about an observer or another scenario proposed by Ryan where there would be some sort of say in, in the decision making, they both raise uh, significant issues that, that, need to be, that need to be addressed. One that David mentioned is, is definitely confidentiality. Uh, it, it is absolutely essential that this person has strict duties of confidentiality. Those are not foreseen in the, in the legislation as it currently is. Um, uh, the government representative may be a civil servant and they have certain 
uh, duties of confidentiality inherent to their to their functions, but it may not, uh, and so this needs to be further elaborated. And there needs to be not only strict regulation, but also strict penalties for breach of confidentiality, not only from the delegate, but also from the uh, in, in terms of the reports that it needs to file. Because if, if it follows the general rules, the reports would be accessible and then somehow, you know, uh, open a window for other operators or, or anybody with a legitimate interest to, uh, to take a look at what's happening within uh, their competitors. And, and that simply can't happen. Uh, I think another issue that, that you raised on, on the comment you made, Andrew, is, is the, uh, when you say strict or not strict, I, I think I'm more concerned about what's the, the, uh, uh, the criteria uh, of experience that this person needs to have. Uh, and uh, you may not find within civil servants people with uh, uh, the uh, understanding of, of the gaming sector from an operator's perspective to, to, to be able to fulfill those roles. So I think it's very important to establish what are the experience criteria, uh, conflict of interest and so on. And then if we move towards a, a, a different system where this person would have some form of say, even if, if with, with veto rights, I think then we raise, we, we, we start getting into very dangerous territory. Uh, uh, and namely one that needs to address the liability of, of those, of the actions or, or, or not action or, or lack of action from, from this person. If, if, if this person has a veto rights and if it does veto, um, there, there's obviously consequences from that. Th those consequences could have an impact on, on shareholders, on, on the company, on creditors. Uh, is this person going to be liable for, for that? Uh, is the government going to indemnify the concessionaire for the actions of this representative? So, you know, apart from everything else, uh, th these, are, these are issues that if we um, move towards that, uh, more of a director kind of role, uh, that, that are concerning to me. All very interesting points and uh, the question also about suitability and the continued suitability. Is it that going to be a DICJ thing as well? Uh, whether the, the, the delegate's going to be, uh, I mean, apart from capability, there's also suitability, which is a, a different thing as well. But let's move on to the next, uh, the next one. Uh, thankfully, the next two are, are, are a bit shorter, uh, I think. Uh, number seven, the, um, there's mention in there about non-gaming promotion. The Macau government has long uh, promoted diversification and promotion of non-gaming aspects within the concessionaires. Um, frankly, I'm not quite sure how that fits within a gaming law. Maybe they just wanted to make the point. Uh, does anybody have any comments on uh, the non-gaming aspects of integrated resorts in Macau? Well, I think uh, this has uh, this has been uh, you know, talked about and discussed for, for a very long time. Uh, and frankly, I think in the last ten years, uh, some operators did better than others. But I think uh, where we are now, I think there's a lot to be done in, in terms of creating a market that that would attract uh, you know a, a different generation of people that would be more willing to to spend money in non gaming attractions so uh, i think uh, we would all benefit the concessionaires would benefit the government would benefit from uh, uh, determining what these obligations are what is expected um, so that there is clarity on the subject at, at the same time uh, these non gaming amenities uh, need to be uh, sustainable um, and and some of them need to be profitable even so uh, <laughs> the, the operators need to be uh, need to have some leeway on to, in deciding what what uh, they understand is the the, the market uh, demand uh, and act according. So if you're too prescriptive on, on what they have to build, what they have to develop, you may run the risk of you know not not uh, building up uh, things that are disconnected with the market. So they would have they they need that freedom uh, to be able to successfully build these amenities. So in terms of gaming law, I guess Macau can take reference to the legal definition of integrated resort in Japan, as they have the most updated gaming law based on international standards and practices, though they are customers still in consideration, right? Uh, in Japan, integrated resort refer to a combination of casino and non-gaming amenities, and integrated resort operator are required to enhance the visitor's experience for a range of quote and unquote uh, Japanese art, culture, and traditions. I think this is something that Macau can draw lessons from Japan's uh, law. 
And of course, the entertainment and show in Vegas with our convention facility here in Macau, we could be the event and entertainment center in the greater China region. I think that's the non-gaming element that we are all uh, looking forward to. I, I think there's a need for the government to take a whole of economy view of this too. Mm-hmm. Um, there's only so much that the operators can do to promote um, new avenues of business. They need support. They need support from institutions uh, which are prepared to uh, go along the journey with them while they diversify from their uh, existing businesses and the things they know best. Uh, But they also need to look at things like the airport, uh, the connectivity of Macau to the rest of the world, um, the language facility of uh, people in the front line of service in Macau, um, particularly with uh, international languages uh, such as English or French, in addition to, uh, of course, uh, Mandarin and uh, and Chinese, uh, Cantonese rather. Um, so I think um, the government needs to take some leadership role in this. It's not just a matter of uh, continually berating um, concessionaires about their lack of achievement in the development of non-gaming. Uh, It's more about facilitating direction, the devotion of resources and mobilising the support necessary uh, outside of the industry to make that work. Yes, make a very good, some very good points there, David. I mean, I remember when I first came to Macau, it was all about mice. Mice was the second, second word out of everybody's mouth and, uh, my reaction to that was always, well, where's the infrastructure? If you're going to hold a convention or a big event, as you say, airport, I mean, we have the bridge now, but we're still lacking in infrastructure. You go to Vegas, which is a which is one of the biggest mice uh, centres in the world, and, uh, you know, their taxis are very well organised at the airport. They, they're set up for that volume of people coming through for conventions, uh, mice events, you know, and I, I wonder on non-gaming, well, okay, you want us to do something different that isn't gaming, what have we got a comparative advantage at? There's no point in doing something that other places in the world do better. How will it ever possibly succeed? I and mean, when uh, Rui said, uh, mentioned about profitable non-gaming amenities in Macau, I thought, what a, what a, what a noble goal. One day we, we, we might even have one. Uh, a little bit cynical there, but... Um, we, we need to look, at, I think, at what we have a comparative advantage at. Uh, you know, Milan does fashion. You know, we do gaming. You know, parts of Germany make cars. There's reasons why these things happen, aren't there? Because there's a comparative advantage for that geography. And until we find something that we have a comparative advantage at uh, compared to other places, why, why would it succeed in Macau is the question that I, that I pose on that. And I think to, to, to David's point, the, there's other types of restrictions that, that really need to be removed and, and that are completely disaligned with, with these policies. And uh, one that comes to mind is, is visas. Um, you know, I've, I've seen circumstances where uh, travelers uh, to uh, attend mice exhibitions were refused at the border because they said that they were coming for business and you can't do business in Macau, you need a working permit, and, and, they, were, and they were returned uh, and couldn't enter. Uh, and the same thing happens uh, to exhibitors. I've seen exhibitors in mice that obviously come here with their stands to do business that, that ended up in, in, in a police station because they were working illegally without the blue card. So um, this happened many times, uh, and, and, and this really can't happen. Uh, if, if you're trying to promote that, that industry. And, uh, and I think on, on the visa topic as well, I think we, we really need to find a way, and this needs obviously to be worked uh, in conjunction with, with mainland China to prolong the, the, the length of visitation. It, it's very hard to promote non-gaming amenities when, when our average uh, length of visitation is uh, 1.2 nights, I believe. Uh, and within that period of time, people need to eat, sleep, uh, they will gamble, that's what they came here for, and, and they have very little time for, for anything else. So I, I think those are points uh, that definitely, I think, as you mentioned, that the, the government could, could definitely remove those obstacles. 
And I know we haven't mentioned, and I won't bring it up, uh, other than to just briefly bring it up, we haven't mentioned Hung Ching, uh, the, the additional land that's been given to, well, sort of given to Macau, but already the voices of dissent are starting to come up about how that's going to operate. But that's that's one for another day. Let's move on. So uh, number eight on the, the list is uh, social responsibility, uh, a very hot topic in Macau. Uh, we already have a quite a high tax rate at 35%. We have another four point something, 4.6, I think it is, percent paid to the Macau Foundation, the Tourism Development Fund. Uh, and on top of that, I think it's well acknowledged that many of the concessionaires voluntarily do many, many great things in so their social responsibility programs. The question I, I want to pose to the panel is, how much more does the do the concessionaires owe to the people slash government of Macau in social responsibility when they're already doing quite quite so much? Does anybody want to have a go at that one? I'm knocked over by the silence at the, at the no. other end. Uh, I mean, Ryan is a Macau well, look, local. Do you have let, a feeling? Let on me, the, oh, David, let please. Me, please. Let me offer some comment uh, generally just in regard to this. Um, I, I think um, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, in the economy has already been done by the concessionaires. Um, what we can't have is a, a situation where government effectively abdicates its responsibility to uh, provide some sort of leadership in, in this regard. Whether it's as simple as saying, well, we'd like more sponsorship of things like Macau Grand Prix or more diversification of public events uh, supported by the concessionaires, um, that's a very simple method of conveying, well, you know, we'd like you to consider that. Uh, but what I don't think we can um, entertain is a situation where there is a mandatory CSR uh, imposition, irrespective of other outgoings and outlays that these folk are making, particularly in developing new facilities and uh, uh, contributing to the build out of infrastructure in Macau. Um, I don't think we've anyone, to my knowledge, has ever put a, a metric on exactly what the value of the investment made by the concessionaires to Macau has been. But we all know that uh, until 2020, Macau on a per capita GDP basis was probably the wealthiest enclave in the world. Um, and uh, certainly, if not the wealthiest, in the top two or three. Now, it's achieved that from... Uh, what was an extremely low base uh, when um, liberalisation first occurred. And uh, it's not all just due to gaming, um, but some of the spin-offs from that as well. Yeah, I think uh, we... Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. I'm actually looking at the, the wording of the consultation paper. So from the tax, I think uh, in addition to the uh, gaming taxes, the government would like... Uh, the operator to support the local SME development, the local industry, and charity work, and also with uh, uh, a lot of uh, education and, and research development, and so on. So I think it's more about how they can actually contribute to the society in, instead of uh, giving money to the government, to the foundation. So um, we may say that people now they want to make a positive different with their purchase and consumption, right? So some study also indicate that a better return on assets is associated with corporate social responsibility. I think it may, it may drive our cooperator to contribute more in order to build a better image for their organization and their business through that. Gaming company may have a, uh, may, may need to find a way to balance their social responsibility and financial goal. It may take some time, but I think they may get the result at the end of the day. I, could I just quickly note there that the supply chains of all of the concessionaires are very heavily uh, built on local uh, suppliers. Uh, 
They have to be, uh, particularly for time-sensitive stuff. And, um, you know, even things like fragrances in the casino are supplied locally. So um, I certainly take Ryan's point. I think the SMEs uh, have been starved of labour as much as anything, not so much capital, but labour by the development of the gaming industry. Um, but uh, this is probably not the best time in the last 20 years to be introducing uh, an overlaid requirement of this type. Um, you know, five or six years ago, I think it would have been much easier. And I, I think they're already all currently making great efforts to do this and, and anyway. So uh, I'm not... I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss to understand why it's in the consultation document if that that was sort of presage it being formalized in some way in the in the in the gaming law and I wonder I wonder exactly how that might happen and if you prescribe just a dollar amount aren't you just making a new tax uh, or just increasing what the contribution already is but uh, look let, let let's move on to the on to number 9 um, and uh, this is in two parts. The first part, probably the major part, and that's the so-called uh, illegal deposits. And this is a discussion about um, uh, deposits, particularly relates to junkets, as we mentioned before. Um, there's discussion there about taking deposits, and, and there's a bit of confusion about, well, what does this actually mean? Is this referring to people depositing money, as you alluded to before, David, uh, as so-called investors or junket owners but really it's lending money to the junkets to to give them liquidity at one percent per month or two percent per month or whatever it might happen to be or does does this refer to deposits in casino cages uh where people are using casinos or junket cages as banks effectively as banks or to move money around or does it simply refer to somebody leaving money in a cage for their next trip it's not entirely clear. Um, does anyone want to have a have a go at talking about uh, this particular issue and what they might be referring to and, and getting towards? I think this is mainly uh, in response to a number of VIP movements that around 2015, right? The door. This proposed amendment tries to regulate the illegal activity of interest bearing cash deposit inside the VIP room operations. And this particular industry practice used to be a critical financing source for junkies, as we all know. However, there's no uh, penalty for such violation in the current gaming law. So in order to address this legal vacuum, I think the government is moving in the right direction to introduce a, a criminal penalty for this sort of illegal financial operation. Um, yeah. But I believe yeah. that, yeah. Sorry, Ryan. Go uh, on. Patrons will still be able to place their trips and cash for gaming purposes in their membership account, adhering to the regulatory and record keeping requirements. Yes. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think uh, uh, Ryan's on right on point with this. Um, unfortunately, some of the junkets have almost developed Ponzi scheme characteristics. Yes. Uh, the reason they can offer high interest is uh, that they've had velocity of money through their operations. But as with all Ponzi schemes, as soon as the velocity of money slows down, mm -hmm. the ability to pay interest with new money uh, collapses. And um, I think um, that may well be a proximate reason for some junkets getting into liquidity problems. Uh, it's also assisted, of course, by what I said earlier, and that is that um, they can't list junket operators uh, on any um, stock exchange that I know of at the moment. And uh, if that was to change, if there were um, uh, listed junkets, I think the light of day would uh, ensure that it was shone in some very dark places, including those practices, and uh, that would certainly assist the government, I think, in uh, what I believe is quite a, uh, a laudable objective. 
Rui, do you have any comments on this one from a legal point of view? Well, you know, I, I agree with, with, with Ryan and David, and I think uh, the document, perhaps because of the way it was released, uh, um, I think caused uh, some panic, and uh, I think people may not have read it thoroughly, because if, if you do read it uh, carefully, uh, the, it is quite clear to me that what it is being proposed to be criminalized is deposits that are cash deposits that are made against the consideration. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the, 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 so the, the, the sort of uh, investment practices that, that Ryan and David referred to, and that have caused a whole number of issues. Many of them are still being uh, resolved in, in, in courts of law. It, it does no reference whatsoever to uh, the prohibition of deposits in, in the normal course of gaming operations or, or for convenience of the players or so on. So I think people over overread what, what the document said, and, uh, and I think... Um, overreacted in this particular point. So effectively what you're saying there, it's interest-bearing deposits. And uh, then that raises the question of, well, how will the junkets finance themselves, as David's alluded to? So they, they need to find a way to finance themselves. But that's that's perhaps one for another day. So uh, the final, very final thing on the, uh, on the consultation document, there's a small section there about administrative violations. I don't think that's caused much discussion at all. Perhaps, David, as a former regulator, you could uh, talk a little about that. Well, I think um, there needs to be certainty about uh, offences and, and uh, the punishment that might apply to the offences. Um, there has been uh, a remarkable uh, gap in, in the way in which uh, prosecutions can be made uh, because you essentially have administrative infractions and you have cancellation of concessions. And that's really the range of your uh, disciplinary responses for um, the concessionaires or people operating within them when they uh, commit legal breaches. Now, there may, in fact, be uh, specific legal breaches, for example, of the anti-money laundering laws, which has its own regime. But um, I think uh, any clarity that government can provide in regard to uh, predicate offences, what those offences are, and the penalties that might be attracted uh, would be a considerable advance on the current situation. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, we've uh, it's taken us a while, but we've got there. We've gone through the, the nine items on the, on the consultation uh, document. Um, there are a few other matters that have come up in, in discussions that we might want to, uh, that we might want to talk about. Um, uh, David, um, you've mentioned a couple uh, to me about... Uh, uh, responsible gaming and harm minimization technology, those kinds of things. Uh, Rui and, uh, and uh, Ryan, you might have some comments as well. Was there anything that the consultation document, I guess we could say, missed that could be that could be considered? Well, if I could maybe just very quickly say harm minimization, I think needs to be a stated objective of regulation. Um, and you can do that in a couple of ways. You can mandate certain requirements as many other jurisdictions do with regard to things like player information displays, clocks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you can go down the route of a code of conduct, whether it's mandatory or voluntary. I'm not a big fan of voluntary codes. Mandatory codes become conditions effectively, of uh, continuing the concession. Uh, but they give the industry the opportunity to provide input to that process. And uh, very often what you end up with is a code that uh, is not only workable, but also uh, dynamic. It can be modified as time goes on, circumstances change. So I, I would like to see a little more emphasis on that, uh, rather than just alluding to it uh, as issues the government might be interested in seeing addressed. Rui, I might go, go to you on one thing. Uh, I know your firm has taken a particular interest in um, 
technologies in, in the gaming industry and emerging technologies. I mean, do you have any comments on new technologies that are out there, payments technologies, gaming technologies that, that, um, that you know, we should be thinking about in Macau and could possibly form something under this law? No, yeah, absolutely. I think until, until recently, I think that the perception on, on technology uh, in and around gaming was that uh, it, it, while it may benefit the business, it could pose um, serious challenges in terms of, of regulation and in terms of uh, you know compliance with with policy goals. And I think in in, in the recent past that, that has changed completely. We, we we have now technology that not only you know helps improve the business, uh, but uh, at the same time as a level of efficiency that could uh, improve supervision and 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 be very well aligned with, with policy goals. And I think the one that comes to mind is. is is cashless uh, payments in a, in a casino environment in, in the different ways that this can be implemented. I think uh, we've we've been seeing it uh, starting to be implemented around the world, and uh, it does give uh, obviously from from a customer perspective, at least on the mass floor, uh, you know it would be much more in line with what customers in mainland China are used to. You know, no one uses cash in mainland China anymore, and they they come to Macau and they're forced to do so. Um, and at the same time, you could uh, you could use the same technology to introduce measures that would be, uh, you know, in line with our minimization goals, uh, with, with AML, anti-corruption, and so on. So um, I, I don't see that, that necessarily that needs to be prescribed in this legislation. Uh, I think if you are too prescriptive on that, uh, technology evolves very fast. So so you don't want to be stuck in law with something that is the current. Uh, the, the current state of the art may, may, may not be so in, in a couple of years. Uh, but what this legislation needs to do is at least open the door for these technologies to be then regulated and, and promote their uh, adoption and implementation uh, uh, from the operator side and from the regulator side. I, and I think that is essential. The regulator here has been very slow and very conservative uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to new games or new ways of, of, uh, of games being presented to players. And I think we need to promote that and to have a fast track of, of adoption of technology, of course, with all the, the tests and, uh, and involvement of, of different stakeholders, such as the laboratories and so on. Right. There's, uh, well, there's one more I just briefly want to touch on. Ryan, I'm going to ask you, apologies for a question without notice, but um, we haven't mentioned uh, yet at all in our discussion about the satellite casinos. Uh, uh, do you have any comments on the satellite casinos and the role that they play in Macau and, you know, whether that should have an effect on the gaming law at all? As, as, uh, as we all know, that they work with the concessionaire to uh, somehow the concessionaire uh, uh, sub-license, sort of sub-license their, their, their rights to, to let them operate their, their satellite casino. I think this is a, a very... Uh, important legal vacuum to be filled. There's no rules, no legislation to govern such a uh, partnership. Uh, we know that uh, they need to go through the proper uh, procedure to get the approval to have a satellite casino build up and, and things like that. But there's no uh, sort of transparency in the process. Uh, we know that since, I think since 2009, there are not many and new or uh, new to market uh, several casino uh, to open in Macau, but there is still a lot. Uh, as I remember, there, there are around 16 or 18, I'm not sure because due, due to the, uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, some closed, some suspended operation, there's still a lot out there. We may need to address this. Uh, I think this is a very tough issue because uh, given the historical reason, they exist before the current gaming law. And that's why, I think the government may have a difficult time to, to discuss with the, with the stakeholder and try to amend the law. I think this might not be the uh, on top priority at the moment, but at the end of the day, it must be, and it will be dealt with because there are a lot of issues that will happen, the employee and the property, and they're getting older and older, right? With embarrassment and, and things like that, it may come up uh, someday or very soon. Yes, well, it seems like it seems like you're right that it wasn't the top priority because it wasn't mentioned in the consultation document. So perhaps that's uh, one one for another day. Well, uh, we've got to uh, 
I think, the end of our nine points, and we've mentioned a few others as well. I just wanted to turn to you, uh, Rui, to, go, to ask the question, well, where from here? We have um, now these four bunched up because of what's happened the last few weeks, consultation uh, days on October 22, 23, 24, 25. The public consultation period ends in October 29. And then we've got a gap to June 26, which is the or June 26 or 29, uh, when, when the concessions actually end. Perhaps you could fill in that gap for us and tell us what has to happen between, between those two points. Sure. So one, one thing that it is already announced is that there will be a, a final report that will be published um, that will, uh, I suppose, compile uh, what was the results of the public consultation and what were the government conclusions of, of, of those results. So that would be the, the next step. Uh, I believe the government announced that they would grant themselves 180 days to, to produce that report. Um, I'm not sure if it, they, they need all those 180 days or if they will utilize them. Um, the, the step after that would be for uh, a draft bill uh, to be uh, put forward uh, by the government to the assembly. Um, the, the assembly then obviously needs to debate it at, at different levels, at a general level and then at, at a special level. Uh, and it will eventually be uh, approved into law. Um, that law will have a period of time to be uh, to enter into force, uh, and from from that moment on, you will have to uh, to uh, make public uh, what we call the tender regulation, which effectively is the the, the rules uh, that will govern the tender uh, and that will uh, uh, you know uh, govern the request for proposals. And then there will be a period of time where the concessionaires will have, and others, uh, uh, operators potentially, the ability to submit their bids. Uh, there will be a process of, of review of those bids, of, of classification of the bids according to the, to, to, the, uh, to the rules of the tender and the criteria adopted. Uh, the results will be published. Uh, and uh, and after that, you know, the the, the winners, so to say, will will have a period of time to negotiate the contract and and to formalize the the concession contract. This is in a nutshell. Uh, this can then obviously be, be breaking up into much more detail of uh, how, how all these what what all these steps uh, entail. Um, now, if you're going to proceed to ask me if this is possible to do uh, in the in the period of time until the, the, my the very, that's my very next question. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't know. I think it uh, it's possible. It's going to be pretty tight. Right, right. Well, certainly if they take 180 days to produce the report, it's not going to be doable. That's not going to be possible for sure. Yeah, yeah. But but it is it it is conceivable, right? I mean, it's October 29, produce a report, get that out before Christmas, propose legislation in January, debate it for two or three weeks start a tender process in March. I mean, it, it, it's doable if everybody rushes, right? Well, David, what do you think? You were involved in the first one. Is, it, is this possible? That's a good question. That's what we should be asking you, David. You have experience in this weight, weighty matter. Yeah. I, I think there's probably already quite a bit of preparation being done. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a draft uh, bill somewhere floating around. So uh, it may be that they can compress the time frame somewhat. Um, certainly, I would think uh, it's doable. Um, if you look back to 2001, Law 16 went from nothing to being passed by the legislature in about seven months. Uh, and uh, the tender process was completed uh, about uh, five months after that. So, um, and that was really being done from scratch. Uh, I, this is not being done from scratch. They've already uh, not only done work, but got the precedent of what happened uh, 20 years ago to rely on. And I, ha I have one final question about the tender process. How, uh, and perhaps Brewery David uh, might be the ones to answer this, how transparent will it be? How open will it be? Will it be a, a publicly available and the scores will be announced or will it be all done behind closed doors? How will that work? 
Well, my expectation is that they'll go the same way that they went previously with a, a tender commission making a recommendation to the chief executive. But um, uh, they won't need expressions of interest. Um, the last round, uh, 20 years ago, there was an expression of interest stage prior to invitations to tender. Uh, but I don't think that's required or certainly it wasn't mandatory at that time. Well, it could also happen that uh, we're all thinking about an open tender in the sense that uh, everyone that, that fills the minimum requirements could be able to bid, but it could very well be a tender by invitation um, that, that would uh, be extended to existing operators and, 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 and perhaps other, uh, other players in the radar. Uh, so that's, that's a decision that, that needs also to, to be made. All right. Well, it's been a, a, a very long discussion, but very... Uh, uh, well, it's a once in 20 year kind of thing that we're analysing here. So uh, probably worth worth um, all that uh, time and great information there. I just want to do a final uh, comment from each. So around the ground. So perhaps, Ryan, we might start with you. I mean, just a final general comment on the whole public consultation process. Uh, how do you feel about it so far? So far, so good to get Given the current environment, right, where we may not actually meet up and and and, and discuss with the government, right, because uh, actually we are coming up with some consultation sessions, so there will be a lot to explore uh, in uh, in in the next uh, few weeks. And um, so far, I think uh, uh, the government has done their job, try to uh, get the public to know about uh, what they want to improve in terms of uh, the market uh, business scale. Uh, all the participants and stakeholders. Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. And Rui, your your final wrapping up comment. Well, as you mentioned, I think this is this is a very very important time in in the history of Macau. I think it's it's a process that will uh, significantly influence not only the gaming sector but but the prosperity and, and the development of the region in, in years to come. I believe that the initial reaction, the very initial reaction from you know, the industry, the, the markets uh, was one where I think the stakeholders felt a bit overwhelmed. There was mm -hmm. a bit of drama, uh, but I think it, it's, it's no time for that. I think it's time to positively contribute. We have the opportunity to do so. Um, and uh, I do think it's an honest opportunity in the sense that uh, you know, the comments will, will be heard, uh, even if not accepted. Um, and, and so this is a time for the industry and for the population in general to, to put uh, their efforts to, together and, and make positive, uh, constructive contributions to, uh, to shape what, uh, what will be this legislation and, uh, and, they, and you know, to try to have a say on, on what the next years will be for Macau. This is an extremely important moment. And David, uh, you get the last word. I love the last word. <laughs> no, uh, look, uh, very briefly, um, I think whatever changes are made, um, one thing that was absent with the original Law 16 was a post-implementation review. So looking at how effective is it in meeting whatever underlying policy objectives there may be, and that's important. Um, there was a review done in 2016. Well, that's 15 years after the event. And uh, in my opinion, that's far too long. Uh, there really needs to be regular reviews to make sure it's tracking as required, uh, rather than major events and creating misapprehension, such as I think has happened here and uh, as Rui just alluded to. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to offer my personal thanks to the to three of you. It's been, a, a, as I say, a very long video, but we've done a super deep dive into the public consultation document. Some great comments there, and I hope very, very informative to IAG's viewers. Uh, David Green, Ryan Ho, Rui Prenza, thank you to the three of you very much indeed. And uh, to you watching uh, wherever you may be around the world, um, for continued updates about the Asian game industry, please visit our website, asgam.com, A-S-G-A-M.com. And uh, that's it for now. And we'll see you on the next IAG Trade Talk. Bye for now.
Oh, 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 oh,